Easy guys, welcome to Showtime, celebrating the music, art and culture of Chesterfield, Derbyshire and the Peak District. Got a great show for you today. If you could help me out first by hitting the like and subscribe buttons, it would really help me please. At their height, they rub shoulders with the likes of Joe Cocker, Fleetwood Mac, Free, and support of Pink Floyd when they came to Chesterfield in 1967. They recorded at legendary studios, Abbey Road, Parlophone, and Rockfield in Wales, and with a recently released CD spanning their whole career with accompanying booklet. Former manager David McPhee sits down with Shape of the Rain. Enjoy. This morning, I'm at Shea Riley, it's the house of um, Keith and Linda Riley. Keith, uh, guitarist with Shape of the Rain. I'm going to be talking to Keith and Ian Tagwaggett about Shape of the Rain, who I managed for quite a while. I drummer with the Blueberries, and I've just been told, I thought, that I'd actually finished playing with the Blueberries before I managed them, but apparently I was still playing with them because we played together at one stage. So I'm not going to say too much more because I'm going to let them tell us the history of the group and um, I'll start with a question for, for both of you. What year did you form the group and who were the original members and how were, we, were you all related? Because two of you, three of you were related. Yeah, well, uh, Tag wasn't in the group at that time. Uh, we were called The Gear, which was a saying from Liverpool. And my brother Len played bass guitar and cousin Brian played uh, guitar, and my old school friend Jill Spike Cross played drums. And uh, I think it must have been about 1962 because uh, Linda saw us play at uh, Clown Youth Club, and that's where I met her. Linda's whispering in the background, it was 60, Four. 64. Right, okay. Sorry. Minor detail. What was the, what was your first group name? The Gear. The Gear. Yeah, and then we became the Reaction, which is when Tag joined. And what were the first venues you can remember playing before I took over as your manager, and before you became Shape of the Rain? Really? We used to do mainly uh, youth clubs and uh, village halls, basically, and uh, yeah, the youth clubs were the main thing. That's where I first uh, saw the uh, gear playing was at Eckington Village Hall. Uh, they were doing sort of like Bo Diddley uh, stuff, from, uh, and, and so that's the first time I saw Keith, Brian, and Len. Yeah, we, we did a lot of uh, R&B soul covers and stuff, mainly because that's what you were selling me. <laughs> yes, that's some kind of mushroom. Oh yeah, right. was it Hudson's then? Before some kind of mushroom. Uh, Hudson's in the market hall. In the market hall. Used yeah. to play these you know, these soul records on this little turntable. Yes. That you had there. In the middle of the market hall. I, I can remember like distinctly you playing the Ultis Redding, and I was just like knocked out by it. Mm -hmm. Although we didn't do any Ultis Redding numbers until, funny enough, Tag joined when we were at the reaction, and he just sing down in the valley. Right. That's right. Yeah. 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 And um, this one for Keith. Before you started writing songs for the group, because you wrote all the songs, basically, uh, other than a few covers that you did, we'll come to that later. Uh, before you started writing the songs, what were the covers you were playing at that time, particularly? Well, looking back, we did things like uh, High Hill Sneakers, um, Louise, the John Lee Hooker number. Um, we did a lot, lot of Motown stuff. Um, we did, in fact, me and Brian just sing It, it Takes Two together. Oh, right. <laughs> really? <laughs> Who did the Tommy Terrell? I'm not sure. <laughs> right, the, the one that had the operation. <laughs> the one that had the operation, right. And why did you stay, change your style so dramatically when you became Shape of the Rain? I think basically uh, I got bored with playing covers and I found out that I could write songs. And little by little, one of my songs got into the act, then another one, then another one, mm -hmm. till eventually... 90% of the material we play uh, are written. Yeah. 
and uh, I was also influenced by the West Coast sound, which again is down to you. When I when I heard Love and people like the Birds and stuff like that, I was yeah. just quite gobsmacked. Yeah, and HP Lovecraft. Uh, without yeah, like, yeah, without trying to copy him, I, I absorbed him. As Dylan says, uh, he doesn't plagiarise; he, he absorbs. Yeah, there's a big difference. Isn't there? <laughs> yeah, a very big difference. And and how did you come to feature twelve string guitar and of course the pedal steel guitar that Brian played? Well, I, I was uh, in Sheffield one day and uh, I walked past the uh, music shop in Norfolk Street. And they had this Hawaiian guitar on uh, display, and it was only about 20 or 30 quid. And I just thought, well, oh, that's something different, we'll try it. So um, I bought it, and I got this number called I'd Be Wrong. And I started playing th the uh, Lap Steel Hawaiian guitar, and realised I couldn't sing at the same time. So Brian took over uh, that role of playing the Lap Steel. Right. And then obviously things moved on and uh, Brian got more interested in the, the uh, guitar, the, like uh, the slide, but then he, he, he bought a um, pedal steel and integrated that into the act. But I mean pedal steel had always been associated with country and western, but Brian used it in a different way. Yeah, and it was quite unique, your sound was unique, there weren't many bands in the whole country actually doing no, that's using that's that's steel, that's that's right. Right. Yeah. And when you became the drummer, Tag, um, you became quite a showman. We'll come to that later, though. But can you remember many of the drummers in other bands who were around at that time, or many of the groups who were around at the same time as you in Chesterfield? I set the scene, by the way. I forgot to mention that we're in Clown, which is near Eckington and also near Chesterfield. And, of course, you were from Eckington. Yeah, but, yeah. So can you remember... The groups that were around at the same time as you? The groups, the, the, the main group uh, from Eckington then was the, called the Cobwebs, which were a guy called Ray Davern, who was the, Ray Davern was the uh, singer, and they used to practice and rehearse behind the uh, West End Hotel in Eckington, which is now a shop now, but, uh, and so what, I was about six or seven, I used to go down there and uh, listen to them rehearse and things like that, and he used to come up, he used to come up and listen to us inside instead of sitting outside. And they had, I can't remember the drummer's name, but they had a really fantastic drummer. And uh, they were playing like uh, uh, blues and rock. And that first really started me off looking at uh, drummers. I was just mesmerised by the drummer. Yeah. And uh, there were a few other little bands knocking about, but then the, all the clubs in Eckington and all that business, they used to have bands on, uh, on Saturday nights, Friday and Saturday nights, it's a bit of Van Tanners. And uh, there were all sorts of different groups then and places you could go and watch. Uh, it's like unbelievable times then. Yeah. Really good. And there was one band, I seem to remember, and I think the drummer lost his arm in an accident. They became quite big, fairly heavy band, but they got a different name back then and you used to play with them occasionally. Can you remember who that was? It's not Def Leppard, is it? That's right, Def Leppard. Def Leppard yeah. So what were they before were they, they were Def Leppard? I, I, I don't know, David, no. I'll tell you. But they were a drum field band, which is near Tuscan, right. yes. so, yeah. 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 When I started, this this one for Keith, when I started managing you, and um, I used to come to your practice sessions at Keith, at Brian's um, parents' place. Yeah, mine's we, yeah. We all used to gather there with wives, girlfriends, yeah, yeah. And, and everybody. Um, I can remember the time and patience that we took on arranging all the, the songs and, and everything. And... Um, it took a lot of time arranging the songs, but you used to do some non-originals as well. And can you remember the non-original songs that you did at the time when you became Shape of the Rain? Oh well, yeah, um, I could, um, Love for instance, we did uh, Live and Let to Live, um, The Inner uh, Planet, uh, we did uh, Do you Believe in Magic by Love and Spoonful, Love and Spoonful. Uh, H.P. Lovecraft, Wayfair and Stranger, Watchtower. Watchtower Dylan, mm, yeah. Baby Please Don't Go, we kept from Year Dot. And that's on the new uh, and that's release, on, on the live, yeah, which uh, we'll come to shortly. Because that, well. that featured tag on uh, Bongos. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. And Birds, Rock and Roll Star. Yeah, Rock that and Roll Star. That was a show for that one, yeah, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 Um, for both of you, uh, I commissioned my friend Roger Bock to do a lot of illustrations for, for, for your publicity. And he also did the artwork for the um, like surround that. to some kind of mushroom right. at the time as well. Uh, he was influenced by Musha and Toulouse-Lautrec 
and uh, a lot of your I think we've got something here yeah that's one of uh, Roger's uh, posters that uh, designed and this an album cover um, and there's lots of other things that we'll, we'll show later or that will intersperse well, in the thing into was, this. It, it, it was the teardrop that, that made it special that's right yes it, it was yeah he also that's just a, a small matter he did Linda's uh, hairdressing shop sign oh <laughs> did he as well I didn't realize that <laughs> right <laughs> In the same style. In the same style as that. Because yeah. it was that period. Yeah. Which even it was all quite original for the time, wasn't it? Oh yeah. And yeah. I remember a photograph of you. Oh, that might have been before Shape of the Rain. No, it wasn't with, with Shape with umbrellas and coloured umbrella umbrellas and things. Oh, that's right. It's yeah. one of the first. Yeah. That's one of the first photographs of the Shape of the Rain. I'm sure it is. There. Yeah. 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 Well, the thing was psychedelia at the time, and we tried yeah. to recreate that, didn't we? Yeah. 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 But the interesting thing was like, talking about psychedelia. There were an article by uh, Justin Haywood in one of the magazines I read. Of Moody Blues. And, yeah. And he said, people at that time were writing psychedelic songs who would never take an LSD. I was one of them. And yeah. you, just, you just absorbed it. Yeah, really. yeah. And it's true that I can see it now, looking back. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the point was, I suppose, you didn't actually have to take LSD to do that, did no. you? But I suppose people who did take it probably did bring a different aspect to it as well so there was a reason for it to some I mean, there, there are moody blues track I, I remember and it, it was titled thinking is the best way to travel which i thought, I thought was really deep yeah and that's yeah. i can't remember what album that's off maybe, maybe in search of the lost cause or something yeah i mean the money that you were getting at uh, some of the pubs was quite paltry really 10 12 pounds and, and this is what joe cocker was getting as well at the same yeah. time yeah. And so I started to get you some university gigs, and you basically became the house band at Sheffield University. Didn't That's you? right. Yeah. Playing with some yeah. some very big names. Um, can you remember the names of the people that you supported at Sheffield University and at other universities too? Mm, crikey! Well, I'm everybody. Uh, well, obviously, War, uh, uh, Love from uh, America, Arthur, Arthur Lee's uh, Love, Jack Bruce Band, Jack Bruce, um, The Gun. Coliseum. Kings. Kings, yeah. Free. Free. At Velvet Underground. Yeah. John Eisen's Coliseum. There's just so many. <laughs> like Jethro like, uh, Tull. Yeah. Tell us the Arthur Lee story at Sheffield University. Tell us what? The, right? the Arthur Lee story at Sheffield University. Well, it, it was Arthur Lee's birthday when we played, and um, we'd done our set, and Arthur came from the dressing room, and he lurched on stage, obviously, uh, intoxicated by something unnamed <laughs> and uh, lurched into my underwater master's stack and demolished it basically but it still worked after yeah and of course you used to do two love numbers didn't you well oh, yeah you didn't do them we didn't do them that night no 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 and he didn't do any of your numbers either no, did he so it was fair that's all true. round really um for tag this time oh well no i didn't mention we got more money at the universities and so we started to get 25 quid yeah. and then went up to 100, 200 over the years and uh, they were the best gigs to do really at the university because you get a better better appreciation from the crowd didn't you? Yeah. Well the thing was though we used to play at Black Swan and uh, we used to play there for like 25 quid or whatever yeah. and Terry Steep was, uh, was uh, the landlord there offered us uh, that fee or the takings on the door. <laughs> So Linda and Brian's girlfriend at the time, we, we accepted takers on the door. Yeah. And it was like three times that at least. Mm -hmm. So it was a good, good thing for us. Yeah, because Joe Cocker was the most popular band who played there. But after him, you were probably second or third. And I can remember the place being rammed when you played. Yeah, to play right. at an ends and night as well. Yeah. At yeah. an time. Yeah. But Terry went absolutely fantastic. He used to look after the bands because... He used to come into the dressing room after first photo or whatever and say, what are you having, lads? Yeah. Go and fetch you a tray of beer and stuff like that. He always made sure we were OK. Yeah. Yeah. He was a big really drummer, wasn't he? Was yeah, big drummer. chap. Yeah, yeah, really good. Yeah, yeah. Uh, this from Futag. You were a good drummer and percussionist, but you're also known as the showman of the group. <laughs> yeah, and you used to get up to quite a few exploits, I seem to remember. So tell us about a few of those, if you, if you can. The ones that you can tell us about. <laughs> Well, in, in, in them days, the, the, the PAs weren't really up to much and as powerful as what they are now in the, these days. And so you only had one microphone on the drums that were usually in the bass drum. So we had to really hit the drums hard to get through, to come up, uh, above uh, Keith and Brian in that. 
and uh, so uh, sometimes cymbals would go flying or wherever a drum would come off and also I used to do some things quite uh, rude with a microphone stand uh, doing during a love song called Live and Let Live but I, I can't say too much about that but some people but we won't demonstrate it. with the microphone <laughs> <laughs> it used to be a laugh it used to go down pretty well but uh, Fantastic, yeah. I can remember you swinging on the curtains at the Black Swan. Yeah, I might have done that. <laughs> you made an entrance swinging on the curtains. Did the curtains come down? I can't remember that. Or were they strong enough to stand it? Part of the curtains came down, yeah. I'll tell you a story now about uh, Taggart had wrote a song called Eastern Woman, which he sang, stood up, and we, we backed him. And our two roadies at that time, Bob Ostroft and Dave Brookfield, uh, to ensure that he got the lyrics right, had printed them on a roll of wallpaper, along with obscene drawings. Right. And they spread it out along the front of the Black Swan stage. <laughs> <laughs> to put me off. <laughs> <laughs> there were lots more, I, I, I know. Though. We might, if, you think, if you think of any more later, we might go back to that. But um, at one stage, I booked Pink Floyd at Jimmy's, at St James's Hall, for the tech just for the technical college rag ball i think it was they wanted a band and i put pink floyd on for them and you backed them didn't you that's right i believe that you tag spoke to nick mason in the dressing room at some stage that's right so we we'd, uh, they sound checked and uh, they came back into the dressing room and we were setting our gear up in, in the dressing room at the back and uh, i got a, a ludwig uh, kit then and he was using a premier one and he said do you mind if i have a play on your kit I said, no problems, like, and he said, well, as soon as I can afford it, he says, that's what I'm going to get next, is a, right. a, a Ludwig kit, but they were really nice to talk to, we just... Yeah. And there used to be a magazine out then called uh, IT International Times, and they were in... Um, so, or we were playing, they, they were full spread about then. Yeah, then. it was one of the alternative magazines I used to start, sell at some kind of mushroom, that and Oz, yeah, and yeah. Friends with a Z, I think, as well. So we were obviously on first, and uh, sure enough, who stood watching us, but Pink Floyd's right at the front, Yeah, just watching us play. Yeah, Friday, really. Yeah. <laughs> Similar story to that, um, we, Blueberries, played with the um, Spencer Davis group at the Mojo at an all-nighter, and it was so packed that Pete York couldn't get his drums through, so he played on my drums that night really? as well. Yeah. And it was also Stevie Winwood's birthday. Similar to what you were saying about Arthur Lee's right. birthday, it was Stevie Winwood's birthday, and I think he was 17 or 18, unbelievably, and we had champagne with him in the dressing room as well. Fantastic. So I think, you did you play with Spencer Davis, or was it Traffic you played with? Uh, traffic. I can't remember. Yeah, yeah. it would be Traffic, because it would be later, wouldn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah, I think at that time they had like a quadraphonic PA or something. Right. They were trying out. Yeah. I think that might have been at, at, at the Picture House in, in Chesterfield. The Picture House? Yeah. W which was that place? Um, it's a bit old, wasn't it? No, not old, the, the one... Uh, Regal? Yeah. Yeah, Regal. right. Regal, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, yeah, there were a lot of big names appeared there, weren't there, yeah. as well? Yeah. Well, Hendrix played there, didn't he? He did, Hendrix. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And um, I, I went to Rolling Stones... Ronettes and Bo Diddley gig there, and that was fantastic. Oh. I went particularly for Bo Diddley, but Stones, it was their first um, first single, come on. And they all did about 15 minutes each on those. That's they? right. Yeah. Um, for Keith, you played at Workington with a band called Earth. That's right. Who yeah. did they become later? Uh, they became Black Sabbath. Uh, when they came on stage, they, the bass drum was covered up with a blanket. And before they started, they pulled the blankets away and Black Sabbath came up. They'd, obviously, they'd seen this uh, on a, a cinema a poster. It was a film apparently called Black Sabbath. Right. And that's when they, that's what uh, they called themselves. Right. And was Ozzy Osbourne with them at that time? Can you remember? I, remember. I, think, I think he was a he council, council, council member. He must have been, wasn't he? he? I mean, that's another connection, see, because what, when uh, we became connected with Tony Hall, Tony Hall was connected with Black Sabbath. So that's right, yeah. I can remember him telling me about their manager, somebody Simpson, wasn't it? They came from Birmingham, didn't they? Mm, that's yeah. right. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that anyway. But um, it's for both of you. Tell me about your London gigs and other further other field experiences. Um, where did you play in London? You played quite a few places, well, didn't well, you? The first one we played in London was Blazers, where Hendrix 
made his appearance in Blake. You were in a small venue though, weren't you? We were surprised yeah. because you, you think if you went into London it's going to be some sort of big place or whatever. It was only a small place and a small stage, you just managed to get your gear on. Yeah. But it was absolutely fantastic atmosphere in there. John Lennon would be going in on all these different people. Well, there were the places for they, these people to yeah, go. That's right. Yeah, that's right. We did like Speakeasy, Revolution, yeah. Marquee. Yeah. Uh, you play at, uh, we did Speakeasy and there's like Eric Clapton walks in and people like that, Ginger Baker's in the audience, people were looking around at each of them yeah. coming in and you stop and have a chat or whatever. Yeah. It was absolutely brilliant. Did you feel intimidated when you played there because of the Not people really, in the no, audience? No, no. no well, this thing, you know, despite all the big bands we played with, we were never intimidated because we knew we were, we were good enough. Yeah. You know, without being big out of Yeah. And sometimes the audience liked us better than the big names. Well, I can remember that. You did actually outshine quite a few of the people that you played yeah. with. And certainly always held your own, at the very least. So Tony Ashton uh, he used to be turned up to some of the gigs down in London and uh, he used to just get up and play with us. Ashton Garden, Garden State, yeah, 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 Tony yeah. Ashton. Yeah. And we said that uh, that uh, Redbone guitarist, uh, bass player, yeah, bass player, player. Ego Ego player. Ego. and he says like, uh, just play this riff, and he says follow me. You could, you didn't know where the one was. It was so complex. Yeah, yeah. I just turned my guitar off. A <laughs> <laughs> mind. He yeah. just. Unbelievable. Yeah, he was very funky, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. I think the Redbone were. Yeah. Um, for Keith, we both love Steve Cropper, guitarist yeah. with Booker T and the MGs. Yeah. He's still to this day my favourite guitarist, jazz, rock, anything, and possibly yours. Um, how much did he influence you? Well, uh, I bought a, a white Telecaster for a start to, uh, uh, to, to learn on, and uh, to me, it, it was. Very simple guitarist, no widdly diddly things, and everything he played was so exact and precise. But I, I think I've said this to you before. Um, Booker T had got like a, a, a bass and drums rhythm section, and they got Booker T playing organ. Mm. Uh, but Steve Cropper was the the, the pace that uh, bound them all together. Yeah. Well, he was producer, he was an in house producer for Stax and Atlantic at yeah. times, wasn't he? I mean, like, if you listen to him play uh, Rock Me Baby on Otis Blue, I mean, it's great blues playing. Yeah. You and the drummer of as well, Al Jackson. Al Jackson and Dylan I mean, the bass player. Yeah, yeah. You always thought he was white when he was a player. No. And, he, and he, his, his rhythm playing was integral to all of that Stax sound. That's right. The Otis Redding records, the Eddie Floyd records, all of those. Yeah. He played the rhythm, he produced the records, he played the rhythm on those. And wrote some of the songs at all, didn't he? And wrote a lot of the songs with yeah. Sam and Dave. He yeah. wrote some stuff with Sam and Dave. Well, some was like tremolo guitar playing on the ballads, which yeah. is superb. Yeah, the first Otis album, Otis sings, um, Otis Redding soul ballads, I think. Mm -hmm. Very delicate playing on that. Yeah. And yet on my favourite album, Soul Dressing, by Booker T and the MGs, He's, some of his solos are off the wall, aren't they? Yeah. Absolutely off the wall. Uh, I think, yeah, Steve Cropper out there. Listen, if you've not heard him. <laughs> um, for Tag, who do you think was the best group you supported at the Velvet Underground? Who I liked, um, well, Family. We don't mention Family. They were yeah. really good. They, oh, they influenced yeah. us yeah. quite a lot. Roger Chapman. Yeah. They were really talented uh, musicians as well. And obviously Jethro Tull. Were amazing. Free were they were really yeah. knock out, weren't they? So yeah. they were a really good uh, good band. I mean these so bands were yeah. just like another level. Yes. Maggie Bell. Stone the Crows, Stone Stone Singer. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And all of this is in, in my book, of course. Book for my book. <laughs> Sounds in the, mine and Ian Lee's. Sounds in the shadow of the crooked spire. A lot of this is on there and there's a lot of detail about Shape of the Rain. Keith's written something in it as well. Um Tag, who are your favourite drummers? Uh, favourite drummers at the moment is um, Bernard Purdy, uh, obviously John Bonham and people like that. And I was lucky enough to meet, uh, we played with Led Zeppelin at, uh, at Sheffield University and uh, I had a chat with him. So he was a really nice yeah. person. And also with, uh, I think Jimmy Page, come up, Keith Tinty yeah, said a few I think, words. I think to, uh, they weren't called Led Zeppelin then. They were called the New Yardbirds. New Yardbirds, yeah. Right. yes. Yeah. 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 yeah, they morphed from the Yardbirds into Led Zeppelin right. slowly, didn't they? But now I'm playing quite a lot of uh, percussion now, so I'm into people called uh, Giovanni Aldego and 
all these different other Congo players, which are absolutely amazing. Yeah. It's stuff now, but uh, he goes with the drums as well. Yeah. Mongo Santa Maria band. Mongo Santa Maria. Yeah, they're they're right. Watermelon Man. Watermelon Man. Great yeah, song. Yeah, yeah. All, all, all well, great tunes. Stuff, yeah. yeah. In fact, it was a song as well, wasn't it? Somebody did it as a vocal, I think. Yeah. 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 But, yeah. So Keith's still writing songs, so um, we don't live too far apart, so yeah. gives me a ring and says, yeah. come and put some drums on, a percussion, and yeah. still, we're still, we're still playing. Still Lots together. of songs, and we'll come to that later as well. What did Jeff Lynn borrow from you, Keith? Uh, my wah wah pedal. Your wah wah pedal. He'd never actually seen one. And uh, 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 he borrowed it. And it was absolutely fantastic for me. It, it was, was that idle race, Keith, weren't it? Yeah, idle race, that's right. Yeah. Uh, Brian's pedal steel playing was, was, I think we touched on it before, but it was a very integral part of your sound, wasn't it? Um, can you remember any other bands who actually featured a pedal steel at that time? There was a band called uh, Los Trios Paranoias. Right. right. And they were a bit of a, a, a joke band. And they actually bought the pedal steel off Brian. It was Brian's first pedal steel. Yeah. And I can remember BJ Cole, was it? BJ Cole, Cole played on many sessions. Who went to play with uh, yeah. Albert Lee yeah. in uh, Old Zeros, I think it yeah. was. And there was a group called The Misunderstood, who I think did as well. But I think there we mention all of the others who actually were playing the circuits at the same time as you, who actually used the pedal steel. So it was quite unique. There certainly yeah. weren't more than three or four, half a dozen at the very most. Who did the song Who Do You Love? Um, oh, yeah. Uh, well, it was Bo Diddley, wasn't it? Yeah, and no, we played a band called Juicy Lucy. Juicy Lucy, Juicy Lucy. Juicy Lucy. that was the other one. Yeah, yes. we played yeah. Them, uh, yeah. at a place called uh, The Temple. Uh, in London, I've got an amusing story to tell you about this. Um, my workmate uh, had never been to London, so we took him on that gig. And uh, there was no bar, and he was looking forward to having a beer. And anyway, halfway through the night, the DJ came on, and he says, uh, if anybody's got any acid, take it now. And my workmate says, his first thought was, it'll burn the throat. <laughs> <laughs> so when I got back, I wrote a song about it called The Starting Point is Green. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> you, you, I mean, we've mentioned the pedal steel. I think we've mentioned the string guitar. Have we? But you, play, you featured that a lot and your original songs. So there were quite a lot of things there that made you distinctive. Well, yeah, certainly from groups I in mean, this area. Nobody played two tall string guitars. Yeah. But we yeah, did. Yeah. You didn't play them both at the same time, though, did you? You weren't no. that player. <laughs> this one for both of you. Um, I'm, I'm going to read, actually read this out because it, it, it's quite important in a way. When I took your demo, demo down to Tony Hall, I'd been previously given him Joe Cocker's demo and that leading to, with a little help from my friends, he was very impressed, but he asked us to wait for another six months before taking it down again, or just a year, I can't remember. But we did that, and I took it down, and he was then knocked out by it, and promised a recording contract. Now, discussions ensued at the time as to whether we go with Harvest or Neon. And this is where I think I, I still feel a bit of guilt here, because... Tony Hall eventually decided to go with Neon because they were the new guys on the block. They were going to do this new specialist label. And Harvest, who had already been successful, were the established ones. Mm -hmm. So he opted for Neon and discussed it with me. And, and I eventually ended up agreeing with him, which now I think I shouldn't have done. I should have disagreed with him, in a way, because um, Neon was a label that faded pretty quickly. I think you and there were a few other bands on it and there's a book, somebody's written a book about uh, it. Neil, Pr it. Neil Pretty. Neil Pretty's written yeah. a book about Neil yeah. and what happened and how it did eventually fade from view. So in a way your biggest chance of being of being a name band and succeeding in that way would probably have been being on Harvest but it, it's all too late for that now but I do f feel, think back to that and also, he also, when we decided that, uh, when he decided that we'd go to um, Bombworth to Rockfield Recording Studios, he said that him and me would produce the record. Now, that changed when he came across um, Eric Hine, Eric Hine, who was the yeah. pianist with um, 
Simon Dupree's big sound. That's right. Yeah. And he said to me, I'm sorry, but I'm going to have to go for his experience. And there he produced you. And in a way, I'm a bit disappointed about that because I still think to this day, I could have done a better job because it would effectively have been you who would have produced it yourselves yeah. via me yeah, there you are. in that sense yeah. because yeah. you knew me more than you knew me. Yeah, I mean, it part. turned out that the album was a watered-down version of the way we play it. Yeah. We were much heavier than that. Yeah. And yeah. The, the, there's no guts on the album no, at all. No, it's, it's, um, it wasn't representative of your live sound, which was much I think meatier. Said, having said that, people did like it. Yeah. yeah. It's a yeah. Have, we got a, have we got the album here to show? Um, or we, 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 can, or we can put it on later. Anyway, that, that, the album we're talking about is Riley Riley Wood and Waggett, which was recorded at um, Rockfield, Rockfield Recording Studios. And there's been a documentary on TV about three weeks ago uh, about Rockfield um, and all the big bands that were recorded there. Um, tell us about your experience at, at Rockfield Recording Studio. It was just a, really, we were just starting out then, and so it was, it was still a working farm as well. So the studio itself, the actual control room was quite nice. Yeah. But the, the, the main studio where it was setting up and all that business, which was like your installs where these cattle used to be and things like that. So you, when you were recording, you couldn't see all the band members. It was just like being isolated. So there, were, there wasn't much uh, atmosphere in the place at all. No. It was just like cold. There, there were no sort of atmosphere at all. No. It was yeah. not at all. I mean, we did just get cows in in the morning. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, it says on there, uh, on this documentary, how they used to go and feed the cattle and uh, milk them in between recording people like Queen, Black Sabbath, yeah, yeah. and uh, other names. Can you remember other names that they recorded there? Traffic did, I know for a fact, Traffic yeah. played, yeah. yeah. And everything. But the bedroom is the coldest place <laughs> I've ever been in my life. Yeah, yeah. We like sleeping as clothes because it was yeah. just so cold. Yeah. If we were recording at night and uh, we got into the studio and found out that we'd left something behind, nobody would go back on their own. It was so frightening. Yet two or three had to go back. It was so just strange mm. place. Yeah, and yeah. I can remember while we were there, uh, Dave Edmonds, who lived That's around right. the corner, yeah. Yeah. was there. He was in on the sessions that were recorded all That's the time, right. wasn't yeah. he? Yeah. Sat yeah. there Pop chatting away. Team. Yeah. yeah, Dave Edmund dropped pile. He had a number one, didn't he? But, but, yeah, um, I hear you knocking was his. Yeah, I hear you yeah. knocking, yeah. which I think was a fast domino number, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, after the album came out and it sold quite well, but obviously it didn't take the world by storm, which is a great shame. And a lot of people to this day still collect it. It's worth quite quite a bit of money. So a lot of people liked it, but they weren't generally the people who liked your live performances, bit because there was a big contrast there. At that time, I decided I couldn't take you any further. I'd taken you as far as I could, and so I opted out. And after that, you got um, quite a few other people joining you in the band. And one of them was uh, Pete Dolan, yeah. who did some very good twin guitar uh, things with well, you, this, didn't he? Pete, Pete joined because Len left. Yes, that's right. And uh, Pete joined, uh, uh, he was going to be the bass player. But uh, then uh, he played some guitar. So we decided it was quite obvious to us that when Brian played either lap steel or pedal steel, Pete could play bass. Yeah. And when Pete played guitar, Brian could play bass. Yeah. So it was a very flexible agreement that went down well with, with all of us. Yeah. And he made the band heavier, definitely. And we were more yeah. looser than Keith, were we? More jamming. We, we, did but we, we also had improvisation on songs. We also had a, a new drummer. Pete Wright. Yes. And Tag went on percussion again. Yeah. Pete Wright was absolutely fantastic. He's retired now from music scene, but really good. Yeah. Good drummer. And, and, his, and his son Dan, Dan Wright. Yeah. Who's still playing now and then. Yeah. And you had Stuart Nick Healy Nip playing Healy, with you yeah. for a while. Nip Nip Stuart, Healy. well known around Chesterfield. And yeah. Bob, Bob Skelland, who was with uh, one of your bands. With one of my bands I managed, Harry Greaves and String Band. He That's was a right. vocalist and he came in and played bass. He, he played he? bass on the, the, sing, the single My Friend John. Yes. And he also sang on it. Yeah. We went yeah. into the studio uh, in, at Phonogram uh, in London and Nick played on drums there and uh, I was on percussion. And it, I think they're the best sessions we did. Yeah. They were just I mean, I, one I or two need, takes. I don't need nobody. And, uh, and we're not their boys and words. words. Yeah. Just so I good. think Shape of the yeah. Shape of the Rain are the best. Ah, yeah. yeah. um, oh, we didn't mention the singles that you put out. You put out Woman, Woman, which is a great song. And that, if it had been promoted, 
could have been a hit. I'm, yeah. I'm I think well, that was one of the things about Neon. There was no promotion, no, promotion, no, no publicity. It? No. And, and no, no really big bands on it either. No. We just did we did some recording though, didn't we, at uh, ITN for uh, for cinemas and that across Europe. Yeah. We did a, a film uh, yeah. to promote it. What but, time's that? I have no I idea. No. So I, I mean, I always thought, and I think I pushed at the time before I left, for I don't need nobody to be a single. Mm. And again, I think either that or woman could have been hit singles if the promotion had been behind them. But unfortunately, it wasn't at the time. Um, for both of you, how many different releases of Riley Riley Wood and Waggett over the years on CD now? On, um, CD, yeah. On, on CD yeah. now, not on, on, on well, vinyl. There was, been some there was one, how many words, there? one came out on repertoire, which I didn't know anything about until uh, Dave Brookfield phoned me and says, yeah. do you, do you realise you're out on CD? Yeah. And that was followed by another one, Radioactive. Yeah. yeah. And then yet another, Big Pink. Yeah. So my Facebook friend in America, David DeSanzo, who uh, worked for Sony Music, suggested that we put a legit copy out and make it a triple album featuring live albums yeah. and another album I did called The Red Album, which was mainly demos. And it's now out. You can buy it on Amazon. Right. Well, this brings us to... The Cherry Red release on their Grapefruit label, doesn't it? Yeah. As, three, as Keith just said, three CD release, and it's got a wonderful booklet in it. How many pages? 50-odd pages? Yeah, it's brilliant. With your whole history mentioning everything, yeah. all of the people who played with you, etc. And it features Riley Riley Wood and Waggett album, it features the Red album, mm -hmm. and it features two... Live sessions. That's right. Manchester. What, Manchester uh, and Alfreton. And, 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 yeah. and those live sessions, they were recorded with very basic equipment, weren't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah, they were, yeah. yeah. Well, the, the Alfreton one, Len was playing bass on that. Yeah. And uh, it was mastered by uh, the bass player from Oakwind. That's right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, a sort of mutual friend of ours, Robert Griffiths, he arranged that because he, him and his brother, ran the concert at Alfreton that he played in, didn't they? That's right, yeah. And so they were in yeah. touch with um, with Hawkwind and they arranged for the, the mastering and, and it's on the, 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 the three I mean, CD the, set. the Red Album has got a track on it called uh, LO503, which we recorded at Abbey Road with Jeff Hemrick. Yeah, that was and fantastic. That was yeah. going to be a, a single, but yeah, that's right. what happened is just yeah. nothing happened, I don't know. Again, that could have been successful because it was a sort of futuristic thing, wasn't yeah, it? it was, Similar yeah. to, there was a, a, something else many years ago on, a, on similar lines, I seem to remember. Yeah, that's right. It was a very People good one. will have numbers, so the name's not the same. Yeah. But that studio, Abbey Road, I mean, obviously with Beatles and everything like that, we went down there and we only had probably about a couple of hours in there, but the Jeff Emmerich came across and he said, right, he says, just put your kit in the corner there. Yeah. And he said, just run round your kit and things like that. And the sound was just unbelievable. Mm. Mm. Like so just so a few you, seconds of... Yeah, you did one Devo in Abbey Road. You did you do one did one somewhere else? Polydor Studio was it? We did the uh, Summit program and we did program. Summit DJM. You were there, I think. Yes, yeah. yeah, yeah. DJM. And there. Roger Bain, who was uh, Black Sabbath's producer, yes, uh, did those sessions. Yeah, they did. Yeah, and another, another connection with Tony Hall again. Yeah, yeah. And it was the guy that uh, Yardbirds. Uh, Keith, oh, Keith Ralph. Keith, Keith Ralph. He came down yeah. after we got out of the pub. Yeah, I won't be part of I can't remember what studio that was. I can't remember what studio that was, man. Yeah. It sounds a very basic studio, but like Tag says, Keith Ralph, like, you were like, wow. Yeah. But yeah. he went pub all the time. Yeah. You're still writing songs, and you've done a, <clears throat> some of your songs with just you uh, recorded in here, in this room, I think, some of them, aren't no, there? Well, on, I, on the I, yeah, no, the, the ones on the first album, I did it Emmett Carleen, which uh, in Rennie Show. Yeah, your, your first individual album. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and... Uh, I did them on a three-head Sony machine, right. and uh, I, think, I think there's about seven songs on there. And David DeSanzo decided that they should be put on the first uh, album. Yeah. And there's one track on it called The Very First Clown. And uh, he, uh, he emailed us to say, when he heard it, he pulled over. He lived in New Jersey. Whether it was yeah. on the New Jersey Turnpike, yes. I, don't yeah. I, I don't know. But he said he played it ten times on trot. Yeah. And I was speaking to him uh, one time, and I said it'd be a great song for Colin Blunson to do. And he became a, 
Facebook friend of Colin Bunsen, yeah. and he suggested to Colin Bunsen that I will listen to it, but I've yeah. heard nothing since. Right, yeah. Well, David DeSanzo uh, was instrumental in getting this release on Cherry That's Red, wasn't he? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, thanks to him for that. But um, you, you're still writing songs, and I think you've written over 200, yeah. haven't you? Yeah. And, I could uh, play about three, I think, now. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of those songs could be picked up by other people, so I appeal now, if there's anybody out there um, already established who wants a good song to record, Keith's got... Well, da Dave is going to uh, set up a publishing uh, f firm, and he's going to publish them. Yeah. So whether that happens or not, I don't know. Well, that, that should help, certainly. Yeah. Um, the... How I mean, how satisfied are you with the three CD Cherry Red release? Are you happy with Absolutely it? Absolutely fantastic. Yeah. 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 I mean, the yeah. booklet's superb. I, yeah. I, I spoke to uh, David Wells uh, about the booklet, and another guy there, I can't, can't remember his name, but he was into that era, and yeah. he's got all sorts of information off uh, the internet. Yeah. And some of the pictures in there, like, I think you've got a lot of them yourself. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah. But the information's really good. Yeah, and it's on sale at Tallbird Records, Maria Harris's yeah, Tallbird yeah. Records at the moment in Chesterfield, if anybody wants to go and have a listen and buy it. It is very good value, really. We sold out in, uh, when it first released on uh, Amazon in the uh, States, it sold out straight away. Yeah. So. Uh, I mean, I didn't realise until me and Linda went to the States and went to San Francisco that the album had not, not been released in the States. Yeah. At all. No, no, again, that's an indication of how bad the publicity was yeah, yeah, yeah. with Neon, wasn't it? We, we went into Tower Records, I think it was, a big record store. And uh, I said to this guy behind the counter, have you got anything by Shape of the Room? So he went on computer, and I said, sorry, no. It's a groovy name, though, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least he I mean, I never realised they hadn't got it because it's not yeah. been released there. Yeah, yeah. Um, Keith, how many guitars do you have? Uh, at the moment, uh, uh, 24. Twen only 24? Yeah. Right. Uh, two, man two mandolins and a ukulele. Right. <laughs> That's not, not bad. How many drum sets do you have? At present uh, time, my poor wife, Annette, has to prove all this, but uh, I've got uh, um, four vintage uh, drum kits and uh, four congas, tabla drums, timbani, timpani, and uh, bongos and all that sort of right. uh, stuff. Shakers and... Have you not got a tambourine? Tambourines. Tambourine, yeah. But I'm into the vintage vibe. I like all the vintage kits. Rogers, Ludwig, Slingerland. Yeah. And, uh, so it's just, just collecting. Uh, and loads of snare drums and things. I just still collect. And so, how many CDs have you got, Keith? Well, thousands. Well, I, I've got to say now where I put them on my laptop because every room's full of them. I mean, some have still got some of been wrapping on. Yeah. <laughs> and when I, when I try to put them in alphabetical order, I find I've got two of some. Well, you've got a few less now because I've started taking well, some yeah, I, to I, sell at high people that, store right, and cafes. That's right. Uh, yeah. On your behalf, yeah. So uh, we're gradually getting down them. Can either of you think of anything else you want to uh, tell us uh, before we wind up? No, but I'd just like to thank all the people who said the name Shape of the Rain or wherever, because you know, a lot of people still remember us, from, obviously, from a long time ago, and they're still supporting us now and buying our CD and everything. It's brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. People stop in street or in Sheffield or everywhere. I remember once remember us. having a, a, um, a Facebook friend whose, whose dad had, had died, and uh, she uh, wanted to auction the album, because at that time, the album, the vinyl album was selling for like 300 pounds. Yeah. And I advised her to put it on eBay. Yeah. But unfortunately, she didn't take my advice. Yeah. But I think she still got something like 275 pounds for it, which she put towards the funeral costs. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. I mean, it, it's over the years we've chatted, haven't we, about uh, how good it would have been if you had to become a big name band and played Woodstock and etc but it didn't happen but what you produced was very special and we've said haven't we that it's your legacy That's your right. legacy is there on that three cd album yeah. and I think it's a, a very good legacy finally how much do you miss playing with Shape of the Rain and those oh, things we really miss it all the time Keith all the time yeah yeah yeah, yeah. It were really good. It were a family. I mean, we went through a lot together. Mm. 
I mean, one, one time we played in London and we got a, an old Bedford ambulance. And uh, when we came out of the venue, somebody smashed the windscreen. Now, a windscreen for a Bedford ambulance in the middle of the night in London is not easy to get. Yeah. <laughs> so we had to drive back all the way holding a polythene sheet. Yes. Up to the window. I think that's an experience. Yeah. The experience that a lot of bands went, I can remember, as driving up from London without a windscreen, yeah. from London to drop somebody off in Norwich before coming back up to Chesterfield. In right. fact, it took about a week from the air to come back full. Yes. <laughs> well, we used to do as well, because we used to be coming back from London at early hours of the morning or whatever, and they were only Brian who passed his test. But when you're on the M1 then, in the 1970s or whatever, there's not much traffic at all yeah. knocking about. Yeah. So Brian used to set off driving, and then we are stopping, somebody would jump into the seat, and just carry on, just say carry on, just kept it same gear, just carry on going. Yeah. That's how we used to come back. I mean, at that time, we used to drive back from London and uh, we'd get back to like Renishaw, where I lived at that time. And my dad would be in the queue for the pit bus at like six o'clock in the morning. Yeah. And then just say hello to him and yeah. <laughs> straight yeah. to bed. Yeah. Anyway, we're going to wind up there. I'm going to say thank you to Tag, Keith, and, and everybody who played for Shape of the Rain in the past as well, most of whom I think we've mentioned. And uh, just to say as well that the story of Shape of the Rain is the story of many bands in, in the country who were almost bands, who almost made it, but not to belittle that because they've all got a legacy in the enjoyment they had in playing together, the enjoyment they gave to people, the audiences that they played for. And so we wind up on that positive note and say thank you, Keith, and thank you, Tag. Thank you, Aaron, for filming this. Over and out. <laughs> well, that's a wrap, guys. I hope you enjoyed this episode again. And um, please make sure to like and subscribe. Um, you know you can get the, um, the Shape of the Rain CD. Um, I'll put a link in the description below. Um, and, um, yeah, if you go through to that, you will be able to get the, the whole works. So I hope you enjoy that too. Okay, here's so many more. See you soon. Bye.